Okay, we are live. Um, joining right. me today is Wayne Wu. Um, I want to thank you very much for spending some time with me. And Wayne, uh, for those who don't know you, can you just tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. Um, I'm currently an associate professor at Carnegie Mellon University. I'm also uh, an associate director of what's called the Center for the Neural Basis of Cognition. So my primary seat is actually in a cognitive science department, uh, effectively. Uh, so we're a center that pulls together the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon mm -hmm. and involves all sorts of people who are working on the mind and the brain. Uh, I'm pr uh, I, I, there are a few philosophers, but there are a lot of neuroscientists, computational biologists, uh, roboticists, uh, machine learning folks, uh, neuroscientists, and so forth. And my, but my PhD is in philosophy, which I got at the University of California, Berkeley, what, 2005? But uh, Seems like forever ago. Time, it seems like forever. Um, but my bachelor's... Yeah, no, it's good. But my bachelor's degree is in, in the sciences. So, in fact, I started off in grad school doing um, scientific work. And that sort of still informs uh, how I look at certain philosophical issues. Um, and that was in biology and chemistry. So. Oh, wow. Okay. I didn't, I didn't realize that. Very interesting. Um, yeah, I had to make a transition because I didn't do any philosophy as an undergraduate. So it might be useful for people to know that you can actually make that move sort of late in life. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> which was... A bit of you know learning philosophy from scratch as a kind of older student, but it's so not as, a bad an un time. as an undergraduate, you were doing neuroscience or psychology. No, or? actually, I was a biochemist. Oh, biochemist. So, um, and I was interested. It's kind of eye-opening as an undergraduate. Um, I was very into chemistry in high school, and then sort of recognizing that you could actually explain certain things, biological properties through chemistry, which I thought was really amazing. Uh, and that's sort of how I sort of think about. The mind in a certain sense like there's certain basic principles that you might use to kind of understand something much more complex obviously yeah, the mind so is a much more complex thing than say uh, sickle cell anemia or something like that but you know that's pretty complex too so there's some hope yeah. yes exactly and that's i think that's kind of in line with the way that psychology in general and cognitive neuroscience in particular uh tend to proceed looking for these kind of principles that explain the yeah. behavior the phenomenon that's right. Yeah. So I, I think um, it was almost a natural segue in some sense, at least, you know, thematically or methodologically yeah. to, uh, you know, or at least informs the way I think a little bit about philosophical problems that I'm interested yeah, in. Yeah. And I, I had a similar background. I mean, I kind of tried to do a double major in neuroscience and philosophy as an undergraduate. And I, I thought I was going to go to grad school for, for neuroscience, actually. But then I yeah. got into the lab and uh, had to chop up my first animals. And it wasn't, that really wasn't for me. No, right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so actually, that was a my, couple of labs. <laughs> I, I totally understand that. I mean, it was actually realizing that I didn't want to do lab work. Uh, you know, uh, it didn't involve animals, but it was still just, you know, the daily grind. I think people, some uh, if you don't do the science, it's sort of, uh, it's hard to, um, it's it you don't know immediately that it takes so much work to generate yeah. good data and then it takes right. a lot of work to adequately interpret it and um, I mean there's a lot of science out there that isn't good um, but plenty that is and sometimes it's hard to separate the wheat from the chaff but you know recognizing the amount of work uh, that it takes I think is important uh, it's an incredible amount of work I agree completely yeah. and, but it's good that there are people like you out there that have a background in the science and are interested in philosophy and are doing both trained in both I think that's yeah. very important um, it's yeah. been one of the themes I've been trying to um, uh, explore in this series, so it's very nice. Uh, yeah. Your philosophical work, is um, is it fair to say that you work mostly on attention, or is attention your main area, or how would you describe uh, it? It's definitely one of the um, uh, uh, foci, I suppose. Um, uh, but it's worth uh, emphasizing that, actually, I came to attention uh, through thinking about the nature of action. And so I would say that for me, it's it's action that's really the primary focus. It just I got sidetracked uh, in a sense uh, uh, with attention. Uh, I mean that's not quite right because attention, I believe, is central to action. Um, so it's just uh, to think about action properly, you have to think about attention. But then I just got sucked into writing a lot of papers about attention, which is probably the bulk of my published work. There's always the word attention somewhere in it. But if you look carefully, you'll see the word action as well. So. Um, yeah, yeah, and, but and it's, it's fact, fair your enough. Theory, your theory of attention has to do with action too, right? That your um, the main idea is that attention is selection for action. Is that's that right. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, and I think um, 
yeah, I get a lot of, a bit of pushback, which is good. I think there are more and more people working on the topic, which I think is great. Um, but if you go back and look at William James's earlier uh, sort of famous characterization of what we all know when we think about attention, uh, you'll see there that he actually himself connects it to action. He talks about uh, attention as selection of one among many, effectively. Um, but the point of doing that, he, he emphasizes, is to deal effectively with things by ignoring other things. And so if you even go back to James, that, that idea, that fundamental connection to the control of behavior is already present. So, um, so yeah, so the selection for action idea, one might think like, oh, I, you know, I've never heard of attention sort of put in those terms. But in fact, I think it's fundamental to even the beginnings of modern theories of attention with James. So, so how do you think this notion of attention differs from the standard or so-called standard views of attention that you find in, in the sciences and philosophy? Yeah, I suppose, you know, I mean, when we say that attention selection for action, we're doing a bit of metaphysics then, right? We're, we're trying to say what the nature of this particular um, psychological process or activity is. And so I think a lot of what's set out in the literature is not per se inconsistent with that. Um, I mean, it, it depends on, and you'd have to have a conversation with a scientist about this, right? I mean, are you trying to say what the nature of attention is? I think most of them, I think when, when you have a serious discussion with them about that, they'll sort of back off and just emphasize that they're trying to understand how the brain is supporting attention or what the fundamental you know, underlying mechanisms are. Um, but they're, for the most part, I suspect when pressed, they will simply hedge when asked to answer the question, what is attention? So uh, I want to just emphasize that I don't think there's per se conflict with lots of um, views that are out there. Um, that said, you know, things like the spotlight model, um, which is a kind of standard metaphor, um, you know, uh, you know, if there's a spotlight, the spotlight is for the sake of getting you to control your behavior appropriately. So I think it all kind of funnels in to that. But did you have a specific, like, a conception of attention that you think might, um, uh, well, I mean, one I was that you thinking like that seems different. Um, um, not necessarily, but I was thinking that the standard idea was something about selection for information processing or selection for further processing or something right. like that, and Good. that seems to be somehow um, doesn't emphasize action at least in the way that it's characterized. Good, and indeed that you're right. So that's uh, if you look at a glossary in a psych textbook, that's pretty much probably what you'll find. Uh, the thing I like to say with respect to that definition or characterization is that um, it's too broad. Right? There's a lot of information selection for further processing. There's nothing to do with attention. I mean, you have it at the retina. Okay, right. so uh, the, the fact that there are uh, uh, there's sort of sensitivity to different wavelengths of light is a kind of informational selection. And uh, there's no attention going on at the retina. So I think there's something correct about that idea, but it's just too broad. And I think the nice thing about James's definition is that it narrows this notion of selection to something more specific. Now, that, that said, there are people like uh, um, who want to say that you know it's selection for uh, perception. So you, you could think of Van Triesman's sort of feature integration theory is something like that. Um, I think Jesse Prince says it's selection for uh, working memory, right, right. Uh, which is part of his theory of uh, consciousness. Um, so, it, uh, you know, there's more to say about how it relates to those. I think um, uh, I don't, I think Jesse's uh, account really is just one instance of the selection for action account. So his is, if you'd like, too narrow. Uh, the issue about, you know, attention and perception, that's a, obviously something we might talk about, but... Um, um, so, I yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. For, in terms of Jesse's view, attention is the gateway into working memory. It's what determines what yeah. gets in the working memory. You think that's too narrow yeah. of a definition for attention. So why, why too narrow? Not that I want to defend it. I'm just curious what your reason was. Well, because I think we, uh, I think we do, uh, there's attention that, has, uh, that sort of bypasses working memory. Right? Uh, so there are actions that I suppose uh, don't, Okay, so I mean, side point, right? I mean, one has to fix one what it means by working memory right. as well. <laughs> it's so, not that easy, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not that easy either. And, and there's a literature about the relationship between attention and working memory. But um, if you think about it as uh, keeping representations online so that you can use them immediately for certain actions, then 
Um, one issue would be whether or not there are actions that don't require that kind of maintenance of representations online. I think there are things that you do immediately in sort of fast-paced actions where you have to respond immediately to the environment. I think that requires attention. I don't think it requires that you put those representations in working memory. Um, so, so I guess so I suppose the disagreement would be that uh, I say it's too narrow because I take putting in working memory as one kind of action. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, or part of an action, but not all actions require that particular step. Yeah, so that's interesting. So more generally, what do you mean by action? If putting in the working memory is an action, it's not something external necessarily? That's right. So mental actions, uh, imagining, reasoning, things that you do in your head, things that you do in your head uh, would count as actions for me. Um, I, this is all part of what I call the many, many problem, which mm -hmm. is this idea that um, so there's an argument that I make where I, 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 I claim that it's a sort of uh, metaphysically necessary structure of action. But I think we can just, you know, for current purposes, just go with the standard case. Uh, and this is why people talk about attention. There's so much information, you know, coming in and to deal effectively, James's idea, you have to select. Right? Uh, so for me, action is really just the behavior that emerges uh, when on the one hand you have all these uh, you know, potential inputs or stimuli, on the other hand you have all these uh, responses, and then there's just many, many mapping of things that you could do, and this is you know behavioral incoherence when you you know try and do everything you can't right, and so you need to select something, and then that behavior that connects the sim stimulus input to an output, that's the action. Right and now, I think you just get James's description. You know, to describe attention, it just picks out the selection of one among many. You get visual aids here right now. <laughs> one, among, one among many to deal effectively with things. So now I have James's characterization of attention in this description of how action emerges from this kind of many, many problem. So uh, that's a really quick gloss about how I think about action. But then to go back to Jesse's view, or just any view, right? Uh, if attention is to be located in solving the selection problem, this many, many problem, then putting something in working memory is just a kind of response, right? But it's one of many different kinds of responses that you can have. That's why I think Jesse's view is too narrow. Um, yeah, I see. Okay, because it leaves out a bunch of other types of actions which also need to solve this many, many problems. Yeah, and I mean, we should so evolve the, the idea there is that you have all these perceptual inputs, uh, so all these re representations of things in the external world, and then yeah. also all kinds of outputs, so all kinds of motor responses right. that you could have. There has to be or mental responses. Like, or meant right, sorry. Just right, to go back to your, yeah, but sure, but typically we focus on motor. Yeah, sorry, but go on. And there's, so your idea is that there needs to be something that connects those. Um, and that, whatever does that, is what you call attention. Yeah, I, there's a subtle difference there. Um, there has to be a connection, right? So you go from this to this in order to generate coherent behavior. And actually, this goes to the a question that you asked earlier about, uh, which is different views of how to think about attention in this context. So one view is that to get from here to here, there is some additional mechanism, and now think of the spotlight of attention, that generates this kind of selection. I don't agree with that view, uh, but you're, you know, you're right that to sort of earlier on to kind of have that in mind, right? That's I think the standard view. That's the spotlight model. Um, I actually think uh, that attention is just you get attention for free when you go from here to here, and the way that you go from here to here is due to a representation, it's due to your intention or any sort of action motivating state that generates this action. Mm -hmm. Its functional role has to be to get you from this mess to this coherent mapping. Right? And, and so that kind you, of intent, so that's the idea that there's a cognitive kind of attention. That's what the... Uh, yeah, you might call it top down, goal directed. Um, you know, to go to back to something again that you asked about earlier, um, this is where attention emerged for me when thinking about action because I wanted to figure out how you get from here to here. The natural thing to do if you do philosophy of action is say, well, you have motivational states that generate action. Well, think of an intention. An intention is effectively a representation of this solution, right? To act, to drink this beer, right? That's your input <laughs> and your output, right? Or this water, right? Or yeah. <laughs> So the intention, I mean, for it to fulfill its functional role, it's got to be, it's got to constrain this process in respect of its content. So I don't like to put things this way, but if there really were a spotlight, it wouldn't be attention, it would be intention, mm -hmm. at least for these cases of intentional action. That is, the thing that gets you from here to here is the fact that you're representing this action to, as to be done. So there's a higher level state, the, the intention, or any other motivational state that is 
whose functional role is to generate action. Its representation gets you from here to here. And now attention emerges just as a way of describing, as James put it, one selecting one among many. Right. So the, the difference is just whether or not you think attention is itself a mechanism that explains this. I don't. Um, and there's a kind of literature about that um, as well. Um, Britt Anderson wrote a nice paper called There's No Such Thing as Attention in Frontiers in Neuroscience, I believe, five, six years ago. Nice short paper if people are interested in that. Um, but anyway, so yeah, so I, I don't think attention is this mechanism that gets you from here to here. It's just a way of describing the fact that you got on this, the input end, this to that. Um, it so, emerges, if you like, or you know, supervenes on this. Um, so then, uh, so yeah, I guess I'm a little bit confused, which is not, not to say what you're saying is confusing, but I would guess I was misunderstanding what you were saying. Um, yeah. So when you have all these perceptual inputs, there's got to be something that connects them to the right kinds of output. Usually that's done in terms of some kind of, or canonically, let's say, not usually, but canonically, prototypically, it's done in terms of an intention, which represents yeah. the kind of thing that you want to do. Um, right. The intention is not attention. That's correct. Um, attention then is just the the byproduct of the connection. I'm trying Good. to figure out yeah. where that's that's the way exactly. you would put it. Yeah, um, you might say it's the effect. It's I mean, effect. I, again, it's, that's a kind of coarse grained way of putting it. But you um, you don't get attention as the explainer of why that sort of resolution of many to one happens. It's just a way of describing the fact that you end up here. It's a, it's a way of describing the input, the selectivity of this particular input as the thing that guides the response. So what does so the actual connecting on your view then? It's the intention. So I mean, there's more to say about that. Um, so one one idea, just to point to something I've written about recently. Uh, one idea is that there's a kind of, you've got this morass here. Sorry, my hands are going to be a big part of this. <laughs> so you've got this morass here, right, of this uh, behavior, what I call a behavior space, is many, many mapping. There's no coherent behavior unless you solve the selection problem. Right. Now, I've postulated this intention. Uh, maybe I'll make it my nose, right? And so <laughs> the intention codes this kind of represent, it represents the action that's to be done. How does it do that? Now, one thing, one way I think that it does that uh, is that it basically cognitively penetrates perception. And um, I don't know if we want to talk about that today, but um, there's a recent paper I've written called Shaking the Mind's Ground Floor, which uh, argues, uh, really drawing on a lot of neuroscientific and computational neuroscientific work on how neurons select their, you know, they, they narrow their tuning to task relevant objects. And what you find is that that's clearly sensitive to the intention, yeah. the goals of the, the experimental subjects, which are um, non-human primates, uh, in doing certain tasks. And it's really just, I mean, the neural effects are really quite striking and, and they clearly are tuning, shifting their informational selectivity in response to what the animal is intending in any given trial. And so um, I sort of pull that together with a more uh, formal notion of uh, cognitive penetration to explain, to, this is an answer to your question, how it is that this intention uh, gets you from here to here, right? There's a kind of informational mechanism that takes the input uh, as input, the representation, say, of a target. And as the visual system is now trying to shift its processing, it's sensitive to that representation. The source of that representation has to be the animal's intention. Right? It's and, what and fixes the goal. If attention, I mean, so if we started out by saying that attention is something like selection for action, and it's the intention that is somehow mediating the selection, then why isn't that what attention is? I mean, you could, I mean, you could go that route. Um, I mean, I think at that point, um, I mean, how to adjudicate a, a kind of uh, a, a, um, that sort of choice, right? So what, now you have the sort of mechanism in place, mm -hmm. right? So you have this kind of dynamic process of going from this morass to here with a kind of top-down signal, if you'd like, from the intention. And then in this picture, you ask yourself, all right, where is attention? Right. And, um, you know, I choose to put it here 
that is to say, as something like an effect of that process. I don't think there's much left for the spotlight model, um, except to uh, see it as embedded in the relationship between the animal's intention and the sort of, if you'd like, the perceptual motor processes for bodily action that go from here to here. Um, now, you ask, well, why not call that attention? Um, I mean, you know, there's a state that's in an intention, and that itself is not usually identified with attention. So I suppose, you know, maybe it's the, the bottom, the top-down signal that you're imagining as the yeah. attention signal. Yeah, I suppose you could go that route. Um, um, I think it, it would be hard to uh, do justice to some of the other things that we want to say about attention if you went that route. For example, you want to say that attention, there's perceptual attention, for example. And there I think you want the, um, what explains what attention is to be sort of embedded in the perceptual processing, whereas the signal that's at issue here is, if you'd like, prior to, or distinct from perception, although it's influencing perception. Um, but I, 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 I think it would be more complicated to sort of flesh out exactly why at that point one should choose one particular part of the mechanism rather than the other. Um, and for my part, I, I would think of attention as in this structure. And then if we want to talk about visual attention, visual attention is really just the visual state that you're in that's guiding the behavior. Right? That seems to me a more natural way of describing visual attention than, rather than say the signal that's influencing vision. Right. I don't know okay. if that was clear, but um, no, I, I'm. I, it is clear. I mean, I don't have a view. I'm trying to uh, push or anything. I'm just, you know, trying to sort out what what you're saying. Um, so, so can I ask then about this relationship to consciousness uh, yeah. that that you view uh, attention as having? Because I know you've talked about something I think which is very important, but which people don't talk about, um, which is unconscious attention, <laughs> attention to yeah, unconscious right. states. Um, right. Attention is can be conscious. There can be it seemingly in um, also uh, non-conscious or whatever, yeah. however you want to use that terminology. So can you say just a little bit about what you, how do you think about the relationship of attention as defined in consciousness? Yeah, so uh, I mean the one part of the James quote that I didn't emphasize is when he says that it's of the essence of attention that it focalizes, focuses consciousness. And yeah. um, that, I mean that's central, that's in the middle of his characterization of attention. Um, so, I mean, there are a set of issues, right? So one issue uh, uh, is something you just brought up, which is could there be uh, attention that is disconnected from consciousness, contra, seemingly contra to what James says in his characterization. And here, um, so I, I've been flipping back and forth on this particular issue. So if you want empirical evidence for that, then I think the way that you would go about, you know, gathering that evidence would be to use standard paradigms to test for, to show that attention is present. And then show that within the, those paradigms or attention as picked out by those paradigms is operative in a case of say unconscious vision. So uh, Bob Kentridge is I think done the work here uh, that's uh, uh, probably I think the best work uh, that would demonstrate this. And so he's worked with the uh, well studied uh, blind sight patient GY. And he uses what's called the, uh, I mean, he uses various paradigms, but the one of the first paradigms was what's called the Posner spatial cueing paradigm. So uh, this is where basically, I mean, really simply, um, you have a cue at the location of a target when you're asked to do a target detection task. Okay, you'll say, let's say which side uh, uh, of the screen left or right the target is on. And then um, the task, uh, the cueing is that, uh, before the presence of the target, you'll get a flash either on the left or right side of the target. So the target can either you know, be present on either the left or right side right. of visual space. And so what you find is that the cue, um, among many things, uh, increases, uh, sorry, increases performance in the following sense. It can increase accuracy or it can decrease reaction time. So let's use the spotlight metaphor, which I don't like. But it's as if the cue is dragging the spotlight to the location of the target. And if the target is there, you're going to be faster at detecting it. And so now you can do, ask the question, all right, well, GY has a blind hemi field. So if we put um, the Q, I mean, can he be cued using this paradigm uh, in his blind hemi field? And the answer is effectively yes. Uh, yes. You actually see a lot of the same 
uh, benefits that you would in a normally cited individual. So the argument there is that you got attention that seems to be deployed based on the standard paradigm. It's deployed in the uh, um, blind field. Uh, and therefore, whatever attention is going on there, visual attention presumably then is unconscious. So I think that's you know very compelling evidence. There was a bit of back and forth between him and Jesse Prince about this. Um, I mean, I, I, yes, I, I signed with Kentridge on this. Yeah, me too. I think a lot of people do, but Jesse's yeah. response in terms of orienting, and uh, I don't think it's very convincing. But yeah. Um, I mean, actually, just a quick side note, Jesse. I think Jesse. I, I wrote this in my review of his book. I think his ideas about consciousness are really interesting. I think he would just save himself a lot of headache if he just stopped talking about attention. I think what he's <laughs> describing there isn't obviously attention. Um, it's He's describing sort of all these oscillations that he thinks that are important. Um, there's no need for him to connect to, to, uh, to attention, to have this kind of interesting view about consciousness. But the moment he does connect to attention, he's subject to all these counterexamples, which are quite compelling you know, for you and for me. And I said, you know, what I said in the review is like, you know, why does he even bother? You know, he gets to have an interesting view and he just eliminates all his obje these objections just by simply dropping the connection to attention. All right, sorry. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and aside. He wouldn't have air has an acronym and 40 hertz yeah, right. representation is, is exciting. <laughs> you got to give up something. You can't have air. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. So, uh, but anyway, so that, that that's I think the, that's the sort of evidence from uh, from Bob's uh, Kentridge's uh, work. I think that um, for me years ago was very compelling. The, the thing that worries me now, <clears throat> excuse me, um, is that I'm not sure the evidence for unconscious vision and blind sight is. I'm, I'm concerned about that evidence. Uh -huh. um, uh, Ian Phillips has uh, recently written a little bit about this. Um, yeah, no, I've seen his uh, talk on this. Yeah. Yeah, and. Um, but but I mean, it's, so the Phillips, are, are his argu Ian's argument, as far as I understand it, is simply that we can't. I mean, they may have conscious experience, but uh, it's just not reportable or something um, yeah. because of signal detection type concern uh, considerations. Yeah, they're conservative, right? They do see it. It's degraded. I mean, they have you know visual system damage. Um, so, and so you find that compelling, or you find that uh, at least some has some weight to it. I do. I think um, so. There's a uh, we can't really get into the details here. I think just because uh, we'd have to look at the paper more carefully. But there's an As a Party and Alan Cowie article in PNAS where they deal with probably the, the most basic objection to the blindside literature, the results, which is that in signal detection theory, um, there is a parameter that is, is, is uh, influencing, uh, is a function uh, to behavior, which is uh, your criterion. Right. So, you know, if you're very conservative, even if you do see something, you're going to say that you don't see it. That's the basic idea. And so the thought here is that maybe blindsiders are just conservative. They're, they have this degraded vision. They're under these laboratory contexts where, you know, it's a bit stressful. And, you know, they don't want to be wrong. And so despite the fact that there's this weak signal, i.e. they're conscious, um, they report not being so. And, and so this is something you can sort of separate and test for in signal detection theory. And so the as a party Cowie paper, I think, is important because they do uh, test this on GY. And it's complicated, the upshot. But one upshot is that in certain cases, uh, there is evidence that he has shifted his criterion. His criterion is more conservative. And maybe we can just leave it at that because I, I think it, it doesn't show that he's not he, he is conscious, but it does raise the possibility that some of his behavior when he denies seeing something is due to not the fact that the signal is actually not there, uh, but that he's somehow more conservative or careful or cautious. Um, yeah. But it, it, if you grant me... So I was just going to say that that's in line with the more general problem of the criterion. I think like, you know, Megan Peters and Hakwan have uh, been that's right. talking about in general that this is a, a real big issue that needs to be addressed. I, I, I agree with that. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So um, I think that's a nice thing about that particular paper that I mentioned was that it was an explicit recognition of that problem in 1991 or uh, whenever it was published. Um, and there, I think the you know, results were kind of mixed in some sense. I mean, there was some evidence that there was a shift in criterion. And there was another weird result that, that's not worth getting into here that was a bit hard to interpret. Um, Hakwan has a nice paper. Uh, Megan and Peters and Hakwan have this nice study in, I think, eLife, which is quite interesting. But Hakwan also has a kind of explanation of what might be happening in terms of uh, criterion shifts in blindsight. 
Um, but anyway, maybe the point here for people who are listening in is just that there is uh, an issue to to deal with um, methodologically uh, right. in in that empirical literature. And just to go back to this issue about unconscious attention, uh, I'm less sure now that at least we have evidence for unconscious attention in the blindsight case. It depends on the premise that the blindsider is in fact blind, i.e. Right. has no visual experience there. And now I'm no longer willing to gr just grant that premise. Um, so I suppose I'm agnostic uh, uh, about unconscious attention. Are, are you agnostic about unconscious processing in general um, because of these kinds of worries? No, although um, I am a little bit, I suppose I'm, I'm, I'm heading towards agnosticism or maybe atheism about <laughs> this idea of unconscious perceptual experience, uh, unconscious perception that you could see, <clears throat> see unconsciously. Um, I'm worried about it. I think it's something I, I think many of us accepted um, and many of us still do accept. Um, I think we need to think, we need to go back to some of the empirical literature that is suggestive of that and look at it carefully. I mean, my own view is that a lot of the neuropsychological cases um, don't demonstrate unconscious perception and therefore they can't be used to demonstrate unconscious perceptual attention. Uh -huh. So even um, like DF and those kinds of famous cases? You, you yeah, that. that's right, that's right. So the, the Milner and Goodell line is that consciousness is divided between the dorsal and ventral streams and DF relies on the dorsal stream for her unique ab abilities to grasp objects that she denies being able to see. And you can already see in that sort of uh, behavioral data why you might think that she's got unconscious vision. Um, but the question I think that we have to ask is when she says that she doesn't see, what does that tell us about, d does it actually give us evidence that her dorsal stream is not supporting conscious vision? Right. A very simple rejoinder would just be that, um, and this gets to issues about the nature of introspection, but a simple rejoinder would be, um, something that you mentioned earlier, that she's got conscious experience that she can't access through conceptual capacities that are, uh, in this context, really served by the ventral stream, right? And the whole point of the milner goodell line is a kind of functional division between the two streams. So one might just wonder that when she says, I can't see, whether she's just giving you, and uh, expressing her, ac her limited access to just part her visual processing, namely ventral stream processing. She's not in a position to conceptualize dorsal stream processing. Um, but of course, the whole issue is about whether or not consciousness um, is present in the dorsal stream. Right. So, 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 so sorry to cut you off, but it, so it sounds like you're in general um, a, a agnostic or atheistic or <laughs> whatever the right word is. Uh, I haven't with, figured out yet, even about, about religion. Stuff, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, about the relation between attention and consciousness. So you, you don't buy the dissociation between the two or you're not convinced? Oh, um, I'm not convinced that when you have attention, it could operate in the absence of consciousness. That is, attention itself could be unconscious. You're um, not convinced about that. Yeah. Um, there's another issue whether or not, w once you start thinking about, say, consciousness in its own uh, right, um, whether what, what the relation of attention is there, right. that is, uh, if they're distinct. And um, I mean, you know, one thesis that's connected to that is all this inattentional blindness, interchange blindness stuff, right? Where I think the basic idea is that attention is somehow necessary uh, for you to have conscious experience. And in that context, um, um, I do think uh, that despite well, despite the evidence that's out there, I don't think there's actually good evidence. I don't think it's actually good evidence that attention is something like a gate for consciousness. The gatekeeper model. Yeah, yeah this, this, that's right. Um, so, you know, to go to the, uh, the famous example of the gorilla, right? Um, are you really blind to the gorilla? Right. So for the fifty percent of you who don't notice the gorilla the first time you ever see the video, where you literally, you know, I mean, what is blindness there, right? If, if attention is a gate to consciousness, you have to be in some sense literally visually blind. I mean, you have to be blind to the uh, gorilla. Um, I mean, it's an odd thing, right? Which is what makes the thesis interesting, right? But uh, I don't think the experimental evidence for that is good. 
Um, so you want to you want to cast it in terms of like a t inattentional and anagnosia or something like that. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah. So I mean, here's another option. So so one option is just that you're literally blind to it. So it's as if the gorilla could be behind your head. <laughs> and I, I think, you know, that just that's an extreme kind of an extreme view, right? And, and why do we sort of gravitate towards it? Here's a weaker view. When you're not attending to it, the gorilla is something more like a black blob, right? It's not the the visual representation of it is not uh, more is, is not very precise. Right. The moment you attend to it, it kind of comes it coalesces, right? And you know, in the context of that video, right? If, if people haven't seen it. Uh, I'm going to spoil it for them, but they can look up uh, a different version of it called the monkey business solution. So this will not be a total spoiler. Um, <laughs> but right, so you're supposed to count the uh, passes. There are two balls flying about. There are white t-shirted players passing it. So you count their passes. You know this, of course. And then there are black t-shirted players. And you're supposed to ignore them. Now go back to James's description, right? You You select certain things to deal effectively with them. That's the selection for action component. That's how we direct the subject's attention to the one basketball. And then James also emphasizes you withdraw from other things. Well, what are you withdrawing from? You're withdrawing from black things, right? right? And so the gorilla comes in, and in a sense, it's in the area of things that you're supposed to ignore. Um, but it doesn't mean that you're blind to them, right? It's just something that is outside the zone of attention, if you'd like. Um, but the zone of attention doesn't necessarily have to be the zone of consciousness. That's the gatekeeping view. So, um, I wonder what you might think about uh, what I think is a more rigorous kind of thing. So this is the change blindness stuff, but not the typical stuff like the, well, I don't want to say typical, but in particular, the yeah. kind of stuff that uh, Grimes, the, the lab that Grimes did, um, mm -hmm. which used eye trackers to yeah. see where people were looking and yeah. changed. So there's one striking, the one that always, you know, I think is the most convincing is the case where you're looking at a parrot. The parrot yeah. is bright red. It's right in the center of the screen. And they're yeah. using an eye tracker so that when you saccade away, they switch the parrot from bright Good. red to bright blue. Yeah. And subjects still, I mean, not all of them, obviously, but a significant portion of them still fail to notice any change in the color of the parrot. Or at least they don't report that when they say at the end, you know, they're very surprised so that the parrot's blue instead of red. Um, yeah. so, so there, it certainly seems uh, that you can't use that, well, they're just, it's a black blob and it's similar to the other things which they're ignoring or directed not to ignore because it's, it's still a parrot and it's you know bright red bright blue those are pretty salient striking features of the parrot That's um right. so i mean common sense would seem to suggest that at some point they must have succotted back to the parrot and had a representation Good. of it as being yeah. you know a different color but they are not aware of that difference or at least they don't report it so i, I wonder would you are you still skeptical about that kind of more controlled example i would say um So I mentioned uh, inattentional agnosia as a sort of explanation, maybe, or, or, or the right way to characterize what's happening under conditions where attention is being distracted away from the gorilla. And then you mentioned the change blindness cases. So the original, one of the original objections to the gorilla case was that it was inattentional amnesia. Right. Right. Um, you saw the gorilla, you just don't remember it, and therefore you don't report it later. Um, and that might be a better explanation. So you might end up having different kinds of inattentional forms, if you'd like, for each paradigm. So for the gorilla, the standard inattentional blindness paradigms where it doesn't require integration over time, what you need to do to recognize a change, right. then I think in those cases, something like inattentional agnosia might be the better description than to say inattentional blindness. It's a weaker description of the case, right? It doesn't require the lack of consciousness. Change blindness, I take it that to see the change, you have to integrate you have to be able to sort of compare two time slices of you know of the presentation of the thing. So the parrot, I guess it goes maybe from red to green, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, to see the change, one has to see that one has to recognize this this uh, difference, right? I take it. I don't know. Um, I mean, I don't know exactly how the visual mechanisms work here, but I, you know, a natural thing to say would be that you need to, in some sense, remember have in memory for comparison at t, time t1, the original color of the parrot, and it's used to cast. So that might be stored just by the fact that you're foveating, fixating on it as they're, they're monitoring by eye tracking, right? right? Then you move your eye away, it changes color, and let's say you do come back a couple seconds later. Why don't you register that? And at this point, you might say, well, maybe it, it is an intentional amnesia, right? An intentional amnesia of the first time point would then make it impossible for you to do the comparison that's needed for you to recognize that there has been a delta, a change. 
right? Um, it's just this kind of speculation there. Um, but then again, inattentional amnesia doesn't entail inattentional blindness. Right. right. Um, there's a so, sense in which you might be said to see the change. You just can't uh, report it because to report it requires that you be able to do this comparison or this comparison occur. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I guess, yeah. Uh, well, I don't want to get too distracted by that because I want to ask about um, in general disassociating attention from consciousness. So I wonder if you're what you think about the um, what I think is a, to me was a very convincing study done by uh, Boxtel and Suchia and Koch. Yeah. Um, where they actually, I, I think it's one of the only studies that I'm aware of. Uh, I think it was 2014. I, I should have looked this up, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think I think it was 20, 2014. It's one of the only studies that I know where they try to actually look at both attention and consciousness, so awareness, perceptual awareness, and yeah. um, uh, so you know what they they want to do is have a high attention, low consciousness. High, high attention, high consciousness condition, low attention, low visibility, low attention, high visibility. Yeah. So what they want to vary these in this two by two way. Um, yeah. And what they were looking at were the effects on after images. And what yeah. the study seems to suggest is that um, when you attend to, to the stimulus, you experience the after image for a shorter duration. Um, yeah. But when you're conscious of the stimulus, uh, it's the after image lasts longer. So it seems that there are these, you can have these different effects uh, of consciousness and attention, which seems to seem to suggest that they're disassociable. Yeah, sure. So I wonder uh, what, what you make of those kinds of results. I think, so maybe I'd have to go back and look at them uh, carefully. Um, so I'm not sure I can comment um, on that uh, directly. But um, I do think that conceptually you might tease them apart, even on my view. So if you thought that attention was selection for action, then you might have attention in a zombie. Right. If you think of zombies, could be agents. Uh, and um, and then that would just show that, that, at least conceptually, there's no entailment from attention, as I'm conceiving of it, to consciousness. Um, and I suppose you could have a conscious creature that wasn't an agent or wasn't capable of agency. And if you thought that that were the case, and again, that you would have an argument that um, that attention can be dissociated with uh, from consciousness if attention is selection for action, right? So, for me, attention only emerges when there's uh, agency. So, <laughs> mere passive conscious uh, subjects um, would not have attention. So, there, at least that you can conceptually tease them apart. I mean, obviously, people like uh, um, the people that you were mentioning are trying to empirically tease them apart, and that's right. a bit harder. I grant yeah. it. So, that's an interesting study. I think. I think the strategy is a good one, right? You try and show that if you have good, good uh, methods for inducing one or the other, and then you can show that they have different effects. I, th I think that's perfectly fine. So the only issue then would be, you know, the kind of issues that you deal with as a scientist: with experiments done right, whether they designed well, whether the, was the analysis correct. But I think in principle, uh, that that would be fine as a way of showing uh, that they're dissociable. I mean, I do th for reasons that I just gave. I do think that they're conceptually dissociable. So, so, okay, because I guess I was expecting a different answer because the, um, <laughs> the, uh, well, this would be, um, well, I, the way I was interpreting these results in the context of this discussion was that they put pressure on the claim that attention is a gatekeeper for consciousness. But because yeah. um, what it doesn't seem like you have consciousness with, with very low attention or maybe even no attention. Um, and, and yeah. you know, they're, they're so, I, I thought that you're, the argument that you were developing depended, or not depended, but took for granted maybe, or something like that, that mm. um, uh, that a lot of the theories of consciousness out there think of this as, well, required in some sense, and that so showing that it was false would be kind of big news. A lot of theories of consciousness uh, uh, depend on the idea that attention is a kind of gate. Yeah, like your argument against global workspace theory um, that's right. And, that's and so right. for, you know, I know you endorse a kind of moder or a moderate position on overflow, which I want to get to. Um, yeah. But I thought that the moderate position on overflow kind of depended on this attention gatekeeper thing. And so that if you show that attention isn't the gatekeeper, then all that's left is overflow or something like that. Oh, I see. Right. Um, yeah, uh, lots of issues there, right? So. Um, I mean, I would want to make a limited claim, which is important to me, because these um, 
Look, I mean, when you teach uh, attention or consciousness, it's really uh, it's natural to use these gorilla videos and so forth. It's, you know, they're they're quite striking, right? Yeah, they're fun. <laughs> they're fun, and you know, you need to have some fun in your lectures. I mean, I, I totally understand that. Um, but I think it's also imparting something that's uh, the the wrong lesson there. So my argument against that view is just that look, the whole point, the way that you manipulate attention in the lab to do these experiments is that you design tasks so that you want you get the object of attention that you want subjects to focus on. You want to ensure that they do focus on that during the trial. And the best way to do it is just to give them a task that is focused on that object. So in the gorilla case, it's counting the basketballs, right? So they're using that precise manipulation. And the thing about doing that is that the moment you do that, and then you find out that they don't report the gorilla, well, it shouldn't surprise you that they don't report the gorilla. To report the gorilla, you've got to pay attention to it. So the moment you distract them away from the gorilla, you basically un you've undercut their ability to report the gorilla. Okay. So that's why I think those experiments really don't speak to this issue about whether attention is a gate for consciousness because you can explain the data without invoking consciousness or its absence. You just explain it by distraction. Why don't you report the, the gorilla? You're distracted. You're counting something else. You're counting you know, passes of, uh, of a basketball. Um, so the, the methodologically, I think it's already not, the, those experiments are not in a position to speak to this issue about gatekeeping. They don't support it, which is what the standard line um, is. Well, I think what those experiments, they're not useless experiments. What they show you is something quite interesting, which is, you know, the limits of how attention can be captured. Right. And I think that's really important, actually, but it has nothing to do, per se, with consciousness. So uh, that's what I want to dispute in the kind of empirical literature, that particular, the whole evidential base. I mean, there are other things like uh, hemispatial neglect, which are meant to also support the same idea. Um, people might know about the attentional blink, which is the difficulty of de uh, um, detecting something after you've already detected something right before it. Right. Um, those are also thought to show that attention is a kind of gate. And again, the same issues arise there, right? If attention is deployed elsewhere, the expectation is that it's not going to be deployable uh, for the target. And then it's not surprising that you don't report it. So, okay, so in, in the kind of ex studies we we're just talking about, though, people are able to report even, I mean, on the visibility of the stimulus, even when their attention is otherwise occupied. So in, in the particular study, uh, the Boxtel et al. one, um, you know, they have them either doing something very simple, like counting some X's on the screen or something like that, or doing mm -hmm. something that's very attention demanding, like counting some things which are moving around, keeping track of them. Um, so even in the case where the attention is a high attentional load, they're able to report yeah. about the stimulus. So doesn't Good. that put some pressure on the kind of no attention can't report? Well, I think the very fact that they're reporting is just evidence that they are attending to it. Uh huh. Right. If you if you report on something, I think that's pretty good uh, evidence that you you've attended to it. Uh, and so I suppose what I would get from that is that wow, uh, even under these so-called high load conditions, there's enough. I don't like their attention can still be deployed. Uh -huh. I almost said enough attention because I actually don't like the idea that attention can be graded. Like there's more or less of it. But again, that's a sort of almost esoteric issue in the theory of attention, right? But uh, my point here is just that uh, I think the the moment you can report it. That's evidence that you've attended to it. So, so it almost sounds like you don't think there could be any evidence against this uh, the view. This is the difficulty, right? <laughs> this is, the, in fact, for, from an empirical standpoint, this is the hard thing, because so my view about the this debate overflow versus gatekeeping is, and I suppose maybe this is Ned Block. I mean, this is maybe what Ned's been trying to do, which is to try and find some empirical way of escaping these problems, but. You know, if you so if attention is a gatekeeper, if it's a necessary condition on, on consciousness, right? Empirically, what you do is you eliminate attention, and now you need a, a measure that shows that consciousness is absent. Well, what's that measure going to be? Now we often use report, but this right. is the problem, right? If report depends on uh, attention, then the very conditions for testing the necessary condition empirically, namely eliminating attention, makes it impossible. Wait, hold on. You kind of cut out there for a second. Did you pull a plug out? Hello? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? You're, you just went...
hello i can't hear you can you hear me what what just happened <laughs> uh what just happened here Hold Hold on a second. Maybe it's my end. No, that's not good. Um, okay. Hello, check, check, check. Yeah, all right. So mine's working. Is what well, did you something happen on your end? <laughs> I don't know either. Oh. Uh I guess let me check something over here. No. No. Uh, oh man, this is ridiculous. Um, oh wait, you're back, hello? Wait, right. you just muted. Oh, yeah. wait, you're back. I'm back, yeah. What happened? I have no idea. <laughs> that brilliant thought of mine was just cut off. Oh, no. Exactly. Oh, no. We were getting right to the good stuff. Okay. Oh, man. You remember what you were saying? I know. I'll never remember. No. Um, <laughs> I'm just not sure where it cut off. But I think we were talking about how you test necessary conditions empirically. Yeah. If something is necessary for, you know, if X is necessary for Y, you empirically eliminate X, and then you find a measure to see if Y is present or not. It should be not, right, if right. it's really necessary. And the point was that uh, to test whether attention is necessary for consciousness, you got to eliminate attention. But the thought is that the ways that you test for the presence of consciousness are going to require attention, for example, report. Right. And so you've basically undercut your own ability to then test for the second half Right, namely the presence or absence of consciousness. Uh, was that clear? Um, yeah, no, that is clear. I, I mean, so I mean. So, that, but then that's a methodological problem, right? Right, exactly. You, and it cuts both ways, right? Because if you're an overflow theorist, you want to show that when attention is not present, you've got some consciousness, but you're in the same boat, right? Um, that is to say, well, usually it's pressed against the overflow theorists. It's usually, you know, you push against them and say, well, show me that there's consciousness there. And their problem is that since attention is gone, they're not able to do that. But I think they can turn the tables, right? Someone who wants to be a gatekeeper has to show you that attention is not, uh, sorry, consciousness is not present when right. attention That's is not present. Hard. But then they're stuck with the same, yeah, it's the same issue for them as well. So, in fact, I think it's kind of an impasse. I, I don't think it's actually weighted against the overflow theorists, because I think you can just turn the tables on the, um, what I'm you know, calling the gatekeeping theorist. So, uh, so it sounds like, well, a couple things, because first of all, it sounds like the way you interpret overflow is that it's overflow from attention. Um, yeah. Oh. Where I think Ned often thinks of it as overflow from working memory. Yeah. Um, those, those might be different. Uh, um, and also, I mean, I don't want to hawk my own view or anything. I don't... But but if you no. were if you take a certain <laughs> approach to the stuff here, so for instance on the higher order theory of consciousness, um, yeah. you can have consciousness without attention. That's kind of just part and parcel of, of the theory. Attention yeah. is not required to have higher order thoughts of the right kind, according to mm -hmm. at least Rosenthal's version of it. So yeah. uh, you could have phenomenal consciousness without attention in any sense, uh, theoretically at least. Um, yeah. And so at, at least on that kind of view, you would still have overflow if what you mean is overflow from attention because the content mm -hmm. of the higher order states would be somehow go beyond what, what you could attend to. Um, yeah. But you could still have reports uh, on, the, on this view. <laughs> Hello, we got an interloper over here. <laughs> yes, I'll be done soon. You wanna say hi? Yeah. Okay, come and say hi real fast. All right, here's, is that oh, where is he? Can you see Hi. him? Hi. Yeah, I can see him. Oh, yeah. Hi. Say hello. That's me. Hi. Name. How are you? How are you feeling? <laughs> He's got his dime. Oh, is that your T Rex? <laughs> yeah. I like him. Okay, right. but I'll be done very soon, okay? So go ahead and wait for me downstairs. Okay. These are one of the joys of the live broadcasting um, during yeah. nap time. <laughs> well, there's a, you know, there are all these famous, uh, there was that uh, famous video of this uh, analyst in South Korea. Do you remember that? Where his no. kid comes marching in while he's on um, NPR, he's on BBC or something like that. He's being interviewed <laughs> about some crisis. And then his child comes, you know, jump. 
he didn't do what you did, right? He was like trying to push his kid away or something like that, like well, while keeping his proper demeanor, right? It was, it was right. very cute. Yeah, well, that's it. Yeah. So, um, well done, Richard. Well done. It's an inspiration to you know parents everywhere. Yes, that was good. Ryland. Good um, for you. Yeah. He's the gatekeeper around here. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Right. Uh, but but get back get back to my point. The 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 point was that. Um, uh, well, I forget what my point was, but just that um, depending on how you define overflow, you're yeah. going to get different answers to it. So Correct. that at least on the higher order uh, kind of theory, you're going to have some kinds of overflow, but not overflow from access altogether because higher order thoughts are a kind of access according to the theory. Yeah. So when you have the right kind of higher order state, you're accessing your own mental life. That That is so consciousness doesn't overflow that, um, yeah. but it could overflow working memory. It could overflow attention. Yeah. Um, and so that was why I was asking about disassociations between attention and consciousness and, uh, right. what kind of overflow you, you're, li uh, limitedly endorsing in particular. Right. Yeah. Good. I, I think, um, I think that's exactly right. I, uh, the thesis itself needs a bit of, you know, clear specification, um, in terms of, you know, what the relevant notion of access, or if we're talking about overflow over access versus attention, what the relationship between attention and access might be. Um, and then it depends on your, you know, what your theory of consciousness might be and so forth. And so I think all these things just have to be set down at the beginning. Like this is the thesis that I'm arguing for. I, I think that's what made the empirical work both really exciting, but at the same time kind of hard to integrate theoretically in a clear way. Just because, you know, I mean, if you look at that stuff, um, you know, what is the notion of attention that's being deployed in the inattentional blindness paradigm? Right, exactly. Right? Um, you know, let's not even start talking about consciousness. I mean, just talk about attention, and that's not even specified adequately. So, um, but but I thought that you're so I thought that you had an argument that was supposed to be in two kind of steps. So the first step was attention's not a gatekeeper, yeah. so some kind of overflow. Um, yeah. And then the second step was well, because of the problems in the first step, then also no cognitive overflow, all cognitive access. No overflow or cognitive access. No, sorry. That the second step was. Because of the problems of the first kind, the attention yeah. you can't report, then therefore yeah. overflow all cognitive access. So I, I thought there was supposed to be a general thesis on your view that consciousness might probably overflows every kind of cognitive access. Yeah, I mean, that's probably too strong that I'm entitled to, just given some of the points that you made about different notions of access. Um, certainly with respect to the uh, global workspace view, because of its endorsement of the role of attention is in putting things into the workspace. Yes. And I think if you think that um, attention isn't a gatekeeper, then, you know, that's that's a way of undercutting the, uh, or establishing a kind of overflow over access with respect to the global workspace. It wouldn't necessarily deal with access under other conceptions. Okay. So I think one has to deal with it on the case-by-case -case basis. I think, the, I mean, the most important thing was the sort of earlier step of just sort of looking hard at the empirical data and just recognizing that, in fact, it's really equivocal. Right. And then, and then also then reflecting a bit on this notion of blindness or these other options of agnosia or uh, amnesia. And just really trying to you know tease them apart, but yeah, I, I I think your point about these all these additional potential ways of un unpacking the overflow or gatekeeping theses, um, I, I would want to back off and saying that you know there's some answer to each and every one of those. I don't think I have them, and, and I think the right way to do it would be to do what you did, which is you know be very clear exactly what each comes to, and then you know go through the empirical evidence to the extent that there might be. I mean that that's where I think the difficulty is. I think getting the empirical evidence is the hard part. Yes. And I think yeah. we've um, we've overvalued things that really speak to some other issues. Like I said earlier, you know, the gorilla case really talks about potential capture. It doesn't talk about consciousness. But, right. No, I, I couldn't agree more about those general points. And uh, just again, in terms of the, the higher order theory, that that's perfect. That's almost what David has been saying for like the last 20 years or so <laughs> is that you're aware of the difference, just not as the difference. They don't conceptualize yeah. it in the right way. So you could still experience it. You just don't experience it as the black gorilla. So I, I think those are important points. And they're often too quickly alighted. Like people just go from, oh, well, you, people say you don't see it to therefore they didn't see it at all. So I think right. those, are, those are very important points. Um, yeah. uh, I, I noticed that we're kind of running over time here. So yeah. Uh, 
I don't know how much longer you have here, but would you do you have time to talk about introspection or how are we doing? Sure, sure. Yeah, we're doing all right. Um, okay. I'm, I'm more concerned about uh, on your end if the T Rex and, and the friend <laughs> he, of T Rex needs. He's uh, now listening to the conversation, so that's okay. he think we're okay for a little bit longer. Um, okay. Because I, I know that one of so you have a lot of interesting things to say about introspection. Um, and, and one of them that I want to ask about was that you need you think we need better models of introspection that uh, yeah. we don't have any good models. Of. So can you tell us a little bit about what the, what the issue with introspection is on your view? Yeah, so um, I would emphasize it's introspection of phenomenal consciousness, or what we yeah. call phenomenal consciousness. So there are lots of theories about introspection and, say, the propositional attitudes. Um, a lot of work on that. So I'm not trying to uh, cast aspersions in that particular domain. but. Um, you know, being aware of phenomenal states. It just seems to be something that uh, we begin theorizing in philosophy about phenomenal states. How? I mean, we access them by introspection. Right. And then, you know, we find all sorts of really cool things when we introspect. And, you know, one thing one might ask is, you know, whether or not the mode of access that we think we have is really sufficient to deliver what we think it's delivering. Right. You know. So, you know, some, some I've worked a little bit on, like, you know, uh, ownership of the body, uh, rubber hand illusion, and things of that sort. And y I don't know, I mean, if you sat there and reflected, held up your hand, uh, you know, does the, my body feel like mine? And now you're trying to introspect. And then, voila, lots of us say that, yeah, there's a sense of ownership. I don't know. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's what are we doing when we generate that judgment? What are we picking out? Um, and I think, you know, how do we sort of, decide whether or not those judgments are accurate or they're worth, you know, drive, you know, starting theories on. Uh, that's my concern. And I think the only way you sort of address those concerns is that you try and um, understand how the me me you know, mechanism or the, the mode of access works, whether it's reliable or not. That's the first question. Uh, you know, of Eric Schwitzgabel's stuff. Um, right. And I, I think that just, it's a nice way of putting intuitive pressure on this natural idea that we've taken, that introspection is this kind of pure, uh, reliable, used to be, you know, infallible kind of access to the phenomenal. Right. I, don't, I think if we're sensitive to empirical work, we should wonder about that. Right. And if I we, agree. Well, yeah. But I mean, if we wonder about it, how do we deal with it, right? I mean, how do we, um, I think we need models. I guess that's to go back to the question. That's why I sort of saying, well, I mean, what are the models of the sort of introspection that are out there? Yeah, um, I don't think we have any on the empirical the, end or even on the philosophical end. The 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 worst one is direct acquaintance. Yeah, <laughs> that's a I mean, bad model. <laughs> I mean, what what is that? <laughs> Nobody could say. I mean, I peer into my soul, and there is this little phenomenal thing, and I I can you know I examine yeah. it and scrutinize it, and then there's the ownership aspect of it, and I. I think one of the biggest worries or dangers, and for at least coming from my point of view, is the, um, the theory ladenness of, of introspection. I think Good. that if you have a bad theory about yes. or a, a theory in general about what you expect to find, then that shows up. <laughs> I think that's that, that's a really great point, and I think that's something that you know uh, we probably didn't we haven't thought as much about, and we ought to. I mean. So I call, you know, there's a lot of phenomenal features out there that people find that I just sort of am puzzled about. And yeah. they seem so confident that your conscious experience has that form. You know, it's, I mean, uh, ownership is already one of them. Yeah. And, um, and like you say, I mean, if I'm already in a position where I think that there's some kind of, you know, special way that the body appears to me, and then I, under those conditions, I go and look. Look right. Um, <laughs> what am I going to find? Surprise! There's ownership. I mean, maybe they're right. I mean, this is one. one should, I mean, I'm not in a position to say that they're wrong, but I think sharing your worries. I think you know the possibility of theory laden. Oh, <laughs> we have a sneaky. <laughs> All right, bud. You need to go sit down and be quiet. Okay, we're almost done. <laughs> oh, we cut out again. Oh, what is happening with this? Okay. <laughs> All hell is breaking loose over here. <laughs> I don't know what happens. What's going on? Are you back? Oh, I think I can hear you. Can you go sit down while we figure this out for a second? What did you do last time? Holy shoot. 
<laughs> oh. Right. Oh, there we go. There we are. We're there back. We are. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know why. I have no that idea. <laughs> right. I need you to go sit down. Okay, bud. We're almost done. We're almost done. Right. Right. Go with mom, please. I'll be down in just a minute. <laughs> no, we're almost done, right? <laughs> Sorry. No, yeah, no, she, that's. I, I've, the been I've been there. I've been there. I have teenagers. It's a different kind of chaos. It's, it's a different like, kind of chaos. Yeah, it's exactly. a different kind of chaos, which you will experience someday too. So don't yes, worry. The joys of it that will not be withheld from you. So, yeah. Um, All right. I'll be right down, bud. Say bye. Okay. Say bye. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Ryan, I need you to cooperate. We'll be done soon. Yeah, the T Rex. Okay. <laughs> oh goodness. It's hard to hard to focus when there's a circus in town and <laughs> no, 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 no. I totally hear you. I've, I've been there. Yeah. Well, thanks for bearing with me. Yes, I know. No, I no. Like the fun, no. The fun memories. No, oh my gosh, I miss those years. That's a whole nother conversation, you know. I know. I'm leaving the nest, so it's like, oh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm half, yeah, half the time I'm on the verge of tears. So there you go. <laughs> it is a, it's uh, a, it's it only happens once. I'm, we're really lucky that we have time to, to spend yeah. with them at this age. You know, especially teaching with a somewhat flexible schedule, it gives me more time to hang out with them. So that's nice. Yeah, they're precious years because they're yeah. still not. Uh, they still love you. They stay exactly. <laughs> exactly. You're, 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 you're not an adversary. You're yeah, I know, right? Yeah. And individuality. So. It's like one of my colleagues often says, he says, wait till they uh, start questioning your morality. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. Oh, my goodness. And that's not all they question. So. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. No, it's all, it's all good. Um, okay. Well, so getting back to the introspection, then what what do you just do you have thoughts about what the what a better model of introspection might be? Yeah, one I think we need models. It'd be just great if people started to you know do that. Um, I, I like this uh, transparency idea that comes from Evans. Uh -huh. uh, at least for the case of perceptual experience. I mean, you got to start somewhere. So, I mean, people sometimes say, well, you don't cover these other kinds of forms of consciousness. And I just say, well, there's nothing out there. So we've, we've got to start with something. So just for the case of perceptual experience, I, I mean, the gloss of the idea, at least inspired by Evans, is that, you know, when you introspect about your perceptual experience, you're just using perception, just deploy, redeployed in a different way. So if you were made to make observational judgments about something visible, you'd use visual experience to inform your perceptual judgment. And so the thought here is that you're just using visual experience to in inform a introspective judgment. So there isn't any weird additional mechanism of introspective attention, if you'd like. The attention is all built into the model that I mentioned earlier with my hands. Um, in the selection of action. In this case, it's a, it's a mental action. It's the formation of a judgment, right? So there are either two kinds, the observational judgment or the introspective judgment about your visual experience of the thing that you observed in the first case. Um, the way of selecting the relevant thing is just perceptual attention. That's the nature of the model. And it's just that the output, the response is different. On the one hand, it's an observational concept that you're deploying. On the other hand, it's a phenomenal or it's a, it's a relevant uh, concept of experience. So the nice thing about that model is that it's all driven by machinery that we understand. Right. It doesn't require something that you were objecting to earlier, and I, me too, which is this sort of you know, inner eye, just to give it a kind of comic gloss. Um, some kind, some different distinctive form of attention that we don't study empirically or in fact don't understand. That's the very crude version of the model. And it's not original to me, it's just drawing on, I think, an old idea that you can redeploy capacities that you already have to fix introspective judgments. So wh what would be the difference between this kind of view and the dis displaced perception view, like some, someone like Dretzky? Um, I mean, it's in that tradition, I suppose, right? It's okay. a kind of part of broadly transparency uh, uh, positions. I think, I suppose what I add to it is um, a kind of conception of attention. And I think um, I'm, all, I, I'm sort of continuing that tradition. And when I talk about reliability, then I think you, once you focus on more concrete um, capacities like attention, 
I think you're in a better position then to then start to think about issues like reliability. So for example, um, your introspective judgments are going to be reliable in conditions where your perceptual and attentional capacities are reliable. Right. You go back to the blindsider. The blindsider is in a position, you know, in his good GY, seeing something in his good field is in a great position to make both perceptual and introspective judgments about what's out there and what he sees. In his blind field, well, all right, his his I mean, although he is better than chance, his reliability is not great. Right. Um, and uh, and so the thought there is that he, not only is his observational reliability also degraded, but his introspective capacities, since it relies on the same mechanism, is also going to be degraded. And this is pointing, gesturing at something that I, we can't elaborate here. Why, but it's gesturing at why I'm worried about introspection in neuropsychological cases, given Evans's model. Right. right. Because precisely the point about talking about these cases is that they have damaged, say, visual systems. And when we start probing them introspectively to get their introspection about areas of damage, my concern is that we're asking them, given this model, to do introspection in what are likely unreliable conditions. Right. Because they're already unreliable for perception. So, so I wonder what you would say about some of the traditional kind of uh, maybe push back to the transparency cases. So, you know, um, blurriness, for example. Um, mm. uh, so I wonder, because it sounds like the thesis is kind of strong in that you, you, the claim seemingly is that we aren't, or maybe I'm misinterpreting it because of the, I don't know. So let me ask you, um, it, are we ever aware of the mental qualities themselves or is it just the properties of external objects, which we then uh. use to form the new judgment? Yeah, I, I I think I will come out and say the latter. Okay. <laughs> but I also, um, but I do want to kind of, you know, put the brakes a little bit, you know, push it on the brakes a little bit, just because I think there are obviously a lot of big issues here that are intertwined with thinking about the nature of introspection. And I think it would be prudent on my part as a theorist of introspection to try and keep those things um, open. But I mean, I, I think that then the way to do it is just to do it on a case by case basis. Uh -huh. So take the case of blurriness. Now, the one thing I want to say about blurriness is that, you know what? Um, People worry about the reliability of introspection, but we have good evidence that um, some introspection is good, which is since you and I both wear glasses, yeah. our vision can be corrected. Right. <laughs> and re <laughs> clearly so, right? Yeah. And that relies essentially on judgments about blurriness. Exactly. It's not quite the way that it's posed in the in the doctor's office per se, but you know, that's the test that you do when you're trying to find the right lens, right? And, uh, while you're looking at letters. And so I think we are clearly reliable in detecting blur. Now, and, and we can also tell the difference between a blurry stimulus and blur due to eye problems. Yes, although I want to be, uh, I suppose, although we should test for that, right? I, right. I mean, uh, you can imagine a condition where you're just befuddled because you know, it's under conditions of uncertainty and you're presented with stimuli. I don't know how you'd manipulate the eye, but there's some way of manipulating both the eye and the image. And then we'd have to ask whether or not you're really, you really are reliable in this context. But the, I agree, there are contexts in which you can tell the difference. So, um, but, th but then your next point would be something like, well, why isn't the blur against the transparency theorists? Why isn't the blur itself a kind of mental quality? No, it's not, it's it clearly well, not out yeah. there. That's where you were heading with that point. Yeah, yeah it's clearly not out there in the world. And, um, I and think you don't the, take it to be out there in the world. I mean, when you don't have your glasses on, you don't think the stuff out there is blurry. You think you're see, see, seeing blurry yeah. or something. I've been always worried about that bit of data, just because, um, you know, for us, we're sort of, you and I are not naive about this. We've been yeah. wearing glasses for a while, and so we sort of know that this blurry stuff isn't out there. But take someone who's just completely naive, and I don't know how you do this experiment, right? But you sort of, um, you know, what you want to know is whether or not when they do experience blurry vision, whether or not there is this confusion, whether it's inner and outer. And I think that's really the more pure case, right? Right. Um, those of us yeah. who report that we don't think that it's out there. I mean, that's already going back to your theory laden point. We're already in the realm where we know too much in some sense to really give a kind of unadulterated judgment about how we take things to be. But, um, um, 
Well, and, and actually, it, it goes to the larger point of like, you know, we do, and this is not a, a criticism of you, Richard, because I mean, I bring up those kind of points all the time, but we do bring up those points all the time. Yeah. And fundamentally, they are kind of introspective, right? And this is the thing about uh, philosophy and introspection right now when we talk about consciousness, is that there is this easy, this is almost, uh, at some point, maybe it'll be a black market where we trade intuitions of this sort, where it just seems so obvious that it's just a fact and a premise that we can rely on. And this is really where I'm, I really want to start pressing, right? It's like, all right, but there's behind that is this conception that we have this kind of clear access to that. And so, okay, fair enough. You, you raise the issue about blur, and I think it, it is a way of arguing against transparency theorists. Um, I've been trying to publish a paper on this for a while. I think what I would say about blur is that it's a complicated judgment. Mm -hmm. So a very, and this is not necessarily your view, but a, you know, a simple view would be something like there's the quality of blur in some sense and you can introspectively lock onto it. And that's how you detect blurry vision. I think it's actually much more complicated. And I think the optometry case is a good illustration of this. I think judgments of blur are comparative. That is to say, sort of like what you do when you're in, maybe not everyone's wearing glasses is listening in, but you know, if you go and get your eyes tested, you're gonna be presented with two lenses while you're looking at a letter, a snow one diagram. And, you know, I mean, it gets hard at some point. You know, like yeah, near really. the end, I, I feel like there's a right answer. And I'm really stressed out. Like, I don't know, show me a couple of times. Like, which I agree letter completely. is blurry? Yeah, exactly. Like, it's like this weird moral failing if I can't get the right answer. But obviously. the optometrists lead you. They're like, better, right? And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's like, sure. But no, I hate that feeling. It's terrible. Right. But, but that's just to illustrate that you're, you're drawing on a contrast to make a judgment about blur. And I think, you know, there's more that needs to be said here, but the quick answer is that I think even in blurry cases, you're comparing two sort of situations. And I think um, that a transparency theorist, once they recognize that, can diffuse the objection from blur. Mm. You're, you, you have access, you're sort of getting a sense of the quality of your access, and you're comparing them. Right? Um, but that doesn't require that you focus on uh, some internal quality, you're focusing on the letter in two conditions, and then you're making an assessment about the, the difference. Right? So, um, I mean, this becomes sort of very natural to us at this point, right? We just sort of automatically make those judgments. Um, but they're hard to come by. I mean, I was sort of imagining, you know, children who, I mean, when you first had to get glasses, I mean, uh, you know, anecdotally, I find that kids don't no, they don't realize that they need glasses, right? Yeah. It's people who sort of see that they're squinting or um, that their reading is kind of degraded somehow, right? They're making more mistakes. Right. Um, a colleague of mine here said, you know, he didn't realize till um, he was in high school when his batting average dropped and they were wow. trying to figure out why and it turned out he needed glasses and you think like that is, you know, a teenager, fine teenager, right? But still, I mean, <laughs> you, you think you'd just like recognize it. I mean, and it I, was, went in, I went in for reading glasses, and then they told me I was had distance problems too. I was like, "Oh, <laughs> I what? did not know." Right, that. Right. Well, <laughs> exactly, right. And now let me show you. They say, and now they give you the lenses, exactly. and now you recognize the difference, right? Yeah. You recognize, if you'd like, how blurry your vision actually is, but what that means is relative to some kind of standard that's set up there. So. Um, Again, what I said earlier was like, you know, I think there are objections to sort of simple views like this, but I think the way to go is case by case. So the case that's at issue here is the case of blurry vision. And I think if we sort of look at the, you know, how that goes, uh, I think um, the transparency theorist, I think, is okay on that particular case. And now there are other cases as well, of course, but again, this is just my strategy. Let's look at those cases carefully. Let's not assume that one has immediate access to blur that you know, some of the kind of natural things that we would say, for example, that we don't, we think of blur as internal versus external. Those are things that are also negotiable because in part they rely on introspection and that's exactly what we're trying to question here. What's the nature right. of introspection, it's reliability. So can I just check to make sure I understand what the general strategy is? Is The idea is that when you're comparing the two cases, there's no need to invoke access to a, a mental quality per se because you're just focused on the external thing. You're saying yeah. this one's clearer than that one and there's no, yeah. you're not really checking your experience. That's right. Um, it, it does. So I don't know if I, if that really coheres with what I felt was happening in the optometry chair. It certainly seemed like I was thinking about my experience, but that may be a theory laden issue, right? I mean, that, it may yeah, be something we have to be live to. Yeah, sure. You're starting with something we have to be live to. Yeah, that's very interesting. Okay. Um, well, we're definitely running out of time now. I don't want to keep you forever. 
So uh, I wonder, if there, is there anything you would like to say that hasn't come up yet uh, in, in discussion so far? Uh, well, it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> so, a lot of fun. I really appreciate you. Uh, maybe I just mentioned because we won't have time to talk about it. Uh, uh, and I don't know, this is kind of self-advertisement. But I also think it's a way of sort of highlighting something that would be nice to get people to continue to work on, um, which is uh, I've just finished the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy uh, entry on the neuroscience of consciousness. And um, p hopefully it'll be up uh, in sometime in the next three or four months. Um, but the thing that I emphasize there, I mean, there are many ways of writing a review like that. And I suppose uh, you would have done it differently in, in, in certain ways as well. Um, but the focus there was on defining clear questions for scientists who are interested in consciousness and want to connect brain data to consciousness. Yeah. And um, I think the first point is just to, you know, something that's come up here as we were talking about gatekeeping, uh, is to be very clear what the questions are. And I think this is so important for empirical work on consciousness. Um, I mean, the two questions in the SEP entry that structure it are a question about what, um, what I call generic consciousness, or people call generic consciousness, this state, uh, this aspect of conscious that's shared across conscious states that right. makes it conscious versus not. And then specific forms of consciousness, which are, I think, most easily tied to content, right? How seeing motion versus seeing a face, right? Um, and I think uh, the review is focused on trying to understand how empirically we can tease or provide answers to those specific questions. Um, it's, but, a great, it's a great article. I think it's going to be really useful once it's published. I mean, it's, yeah, it must have yeah. been a tremendous amount of work. I can't imagine how much, how many hours you spent putting that yeah, together. Yeah, well, you were very helpful in that, too. Oh, so wow, thanks. I, I, I also noticed IIT made it into the final draft. Well, okay, that's another conversation, but we will not speak of it <laughs> We here, will not right? speak of it, yes. <laughs> so, but, um, yeah, this is great. I appreciate it. It's you been great fun for me, too. Me. So with that, I want to thank you. Just stay on for just a second. I'll talk to you afterwards just for a quick second. Okay. But I want to thank right. you very much for taking this time talking to me. It's been very, very much fun. Yeah. Thanks again.